itself. Why is this logic of the doctrine faulty? Because first, God can certainly comprehend man. All there is of man is mind. All there is of deity is the same. A principle thus comprehends itself. Man is God's image, and can do in a small what he does on an infinite scale. And the only difference between deity and a full man simply is that the former can comprehend the parts of the realm separately and together, while the latter can only grasp each truth as it swims to him on the rolling waves of time's great sea. Yet, so far as he goes, he comprehends himself. The day will dawn when, looking back at what he was, he shall fully understand the mystery. And as he advances, he will continually read the foregone scrolls, while new acraments of being will ever be his, each one in turn to undergo the scrutiny, each one to be fully understood, and so on forever and I. Were it not so, being, being would be worthless, and our existence a dreadful farce. Secondly, intuition has already been proved to be the shoot, of which omniscience is the tree, which fact forever disposes of the absurd dogma just quoted. There are two mighty problems up for solution. These are, what and where is God? On which I intend to write some day. And the other is, what is the soul? Which I am now partly solving. This last has proved itself to be the profoundest of all questions, and very difficult of solution. But only so because investigators have mistaken their vocation and analyzed a few of the faculties, qualities, and affections of the mind, all the while imagining the soul itself to be under their microscopes, whereas the soul was calmly, placidly looking on, and wondering why they were so busy intent on examining the firs and bushes instead of the deep, rich soil whence they sprung. Faculty, fancy, and dream life are but the three of the soul's most common moods, and yet metaphysicians have confined themselves to but little else in their analysis. These are but three little rays from amidst the multitude of others, proceeding from one common source. Yet, if even these were all analyzed, understood, and known, the great center whence the eminent would still remain as a great mystery as ever. Nearly all that we know of the soul is really not of it, but of its methods of display. There is something more of a man than life, limb, sense, faculty, affections, feeling, and sex. There's a depth beneath them all, and into these deeps I believe it is possible to dive, and to bring up many a pearl and crystal and grains of golden sand from the floor of his being, from out of the silver sea of life, whose waters flow soulward and have their rise beneath the throne. Therein sitteth forevermore the infinite, eternal, the great I Am. I, it is possible to know oneself, notwithstanding that, to ninety-nine persons in a hundred, there seems to be an impenetrable cloud, circumvolving them, an obscurity, thick and dark as night, hemming them into all sides. Yes, thank heaven, man can unite the Gordian, the Gordian knot, and triumphantly pass the Rubicon, but not over the bridge of spiritualism, obsession, drugs, or any of the ordinary means usually resorted to, but through the continued exertion of steadfastness, attention, purpose, and will, the four golden posts to which are hung the double gates, which open in both worlds. Souls are, of course, the subjects of number, and in the sense are particles, souls, of course, being plural, yet soul is not. For although you may subtract 48 from 49 and leave a remaining unit, Yet that unit is absolutely one, and you could no more dismember it than you could find the lost particles of dust on the midge's wing. Spirit is substance in absolute coalesce. Matter is substance whose particles never touch each other, and soul is the development of the monad. A thought of a house is, until the thought be actualized, surrounded with matter conforming to its shape, a monad. There was a period when God was alone. He thought and he the product of that thought is the material universe as we see it. He thought again, and lo, the thoughts, each one complete in itself, took outer garments and became human beings. Far off in the past eternities, God's thoughts went forth. These were the monads. First, they entered into lower forms, then higher and higher, till at last they reached organizations adapted to the perfect ripening of that which had all along been growing.
The ripening produced intelligence. That intelligence is the soil out of which intuition grows. And what this last advances to we already know. How long and through the countless numbers of diverse forms these transmigrations lasted and passed, it were impossible to tell. We all have an indistinct retrovisions, flashes of back thought, dim and vague reminiscences of a pre-state of existence. And we also know that there are marvelous remembrances between men and animal creation, just as if the soul, on quitting an inferior or superior form, retains something of its former surroundings and characteristics. Some men physically resemble the ox, lion, tiger, dog, owl, bat, deer, and we know that the Myras resemble their mentality, the traits of characters, habits, and dispositions pertaining to all these animals, and others as the fox, snake, eagle, peacock, swine, and so forth, on to the end of a long chapter. When I was a flower, said a little child, that child had an intuition of a mighty fact. Now all these astonishing likenesses are not accidental, but exist in accordance with the great law of transmigration. Mind me, I do not say or believe that any man or woman was ever a dog, viper, vampire bat, or tiger, but I do affirm that the monads, which now constitute their souls, once sustained a very close relationship to the beasts of the field, and have not yet got rid of the effects of that alliance. This is a matter too clear to be disputed, else why these were very remarkable resemblances. I know that some people will poo poo at this idea, but that won't account for the likeness. A man never was a dog or an owl, yet both dogs and owls were originally made in order that the human monad, in passing a sort of gestation period in them, might be ripened slowly and prepared for what he is now. I have at present no matter of doubt.